part of the solution to loneliness is getting to a place of of, of internal uh, acceptance or internal peace with oneself. And I think it's based on a spiritual connection to what is greater than us. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. Hello. In last week's episode, we touched upon what the Surgeon General of the United States considered the most critical public health challenge we're facing, loneliness. So to recap, for those who didn't listen last week, the Surgeon General has experienced it himself. He said that when Dr. Murthy's first stint as Surgeon General ended in 2017, he felt profound loneliness. He was no longer going to his office and interacting with colleagues. And while he was Surgeon General, he had let his friendships last, lapse. In retrospect, he acknowledged that he made a critical mistake focusing on work over maintaining his friendships. So today we're going to discuss many things. And I think there's a, so many different situations of why we find ourselves feeling lonely, how we got there, and some of us feel stuck and not really being able to get out. If you search the word lonely on TikTok, which I'm pretty sure you have not. I have not. You'll be given a seemingly endless list of videos of people speaking into camera and talking about their overwhelming sense of loneliness. I mean, honestly, I I did, did, I did that for this, but it, I had to look away very often. It's really sad. Well, the numbers are 50%, at any given time, 50% of, of, of the world is experiencing loneliness. It's, One in two people, it's crazy. And it's most common in uh, uh, Gen Z and um, the younger generation. I sound really old for a second. <laughs> Are you Gen Z? Not Gen Z, you're, you're, no. the, you're the younger generation. <laughs> um, so in these TikTok videos, many of them are in tears. They feel powerless. After all, loneliness is dependent on connection to other people, and more and more people are at loss of how to find those connections, and once found, maintain them. So Vivek Murthy, he said, given the significant health consequences of loneliness and isolation, we must prioritize building social connection the same way we've prioritized other critical public health issues such as tobacco, obesity, substance use disorders. So I thought it was really interesting and, and really powerful and a great kind of perspective to have in being able to combat loneliness uh, globally. But I want to ask you personally, have you ever been lonely? I was going to ask you, have I ever felt lonely? I don't think that I have. <laughs> Is that a problem? This makes you the unique you that you are. <laughs> let me think, let me think. Lonely. Because, and this is something that I wanted to speak about. Well, then don't jump the gun. I know where you're going to go already. <laughs> okay. I think, what if we didn't call it lonely? But I think you were very much a loner, like when I met you, at least, you were always to yourself, just studying right, but, quiet. Uh, but you didn't feel lonely. Right, because loneliness, I think, is is, is described as somebody who is... Not even not comfortable a, with themselves. Well, no, well, that, but also somebody who is not um, having as much social connections and interactions that he or she desires. You should desire them. them. <laughs> exactly. Which is, well, which, which is problematic, I think, a bit. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but you're let's, busy let's, doing... Let's get deeper. Let's you're get deeper. busy doing so more what is important my problem? things at the time, I yes. think. Well, I, I have to say, that's the, and that's the truth. The truth is that growing up, I was very much interested in study and my spiritual connection to the light of the Creator, that that really filled me. So I, therefore, I did not feel, feel lonely. And by the way, I think it is important. You don't Maybe we don't want to talk about this right now, but I, I do think that part of the solution to loneliness is getting to a place of, of, of internal uh, acceptance or internal peace with oneself. And I think it's based on a spiritual connection to what is greater than us. That does not replace completely the need for social uh, interactions and connections. And, and I have to say, and I have mentioned this before, that as I grew older, it certainly became more, and certainly as you go through challenges in life, that the need, the the clear, the clearer and clearer need for friendships, connection, community becomes stronger. Absolutely, um, and I think we gain more of an appreciation for that, those roles in our right. lives. Um, but the key word here really is, I think, people who are lonely feel disconnected from everything, especially themselves. 
and well, I was before you said I was going to ask you: Have you ever felt lonely? Yeah, I have. I think um, in waves, right? I didn't feel lonely when I was a child, like a young, young child. Um, and then when we moved from the place that I had called home, from New Orleans, and we moved to Beverly Hills, I felt very lonely because I felt disconnected from. I felt disconnected from. Um, just this new place, stereotypes. Like I just felt like I was uprooted and put into something. So I felt very, I felt like nobody was experiencing what I was experiencing, which of course isn't true, but I think that goes hand in hand with feeling lonely. And I felt very isolated and I felt like there was no point of talking about it because I was a bit hopeless as well. So it feels overwhelming. Um, and I, I think that's what our goal really in today's topic is that people should hopefully by the end of this conversation realize that everybody feels this at one time or another until you realize that you have the power to change all of that. So even if we look at the definition of loneliness, it's not going to even begin to describe how people are really feeling when they're in that state. Physiologically, there are a load of things that happen as well from, this is chronic loneliness. It affects our mental state. Um, you have people who are single, people who live alone, people who are elderly, people who are widowed, but even people who are in a big family can feel these feelings. Half of everybody in the United States statistically is lonely, as you said, 50%. And there was a report from the Harvard University initiative found six in 10 young adults at, and 51% of mothers with young children reported as feeling very lonely. What I wanted to share is some of the science on this, because I think you know, sometimes whether we're ourselves are experiencing it or others are experiencing it, we might say, okay, this is, you know, an emotional issue. Um, but clearly it's not. So do you think that even science is looking at things? You think people just see things as just emotional, I think, or just psychological? I, I think at this point, but I want to hear what you're saying. It's people look at all all three, right? Body, mind, and spirit when looking at But I think I think again, I think if you'd ask the man on the street and you'd say, uh, what are the dangers, or what are the negative impacts of loneliness? I think again, most people would understand that it has emotional impacts. I don't think that the 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 physical impacts are as clear. I didn't, I couldn't have told you what I learned after reading some of the books really, and like the research. Dementia, on this. I mean, a ton of yeah. things. Yeah. So, so one of the first I people did, I do know about that. <laughs> about no, I do know about the physiological effects of mental states, even spiritual states, right, or lack thereof. So, Dr. Ju um, Julianne Holt Lundstad st uh, did a, a very lengthy study, and she showed it showed that people with strong social relationships are fifty percent less likely to die prematurely mm -hmm. than people with weak social relationships. That's crazy. That's a huge, that's number. a huge number. Even more striking, she found that the impact of lacking social connection on reducing lifespan is equal to the risk of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I read that. And it's greater than the risk associated with obesity, excess alcohol consumption, and lack of exercise. Simply put, Julianne had found that weak social connections can be a significant danger to our health, which means, which again, crazy, that a person who does not have many or, or strong social connections is 50% more likely to die prematurely, which is crazy. Five years later, again, she did many different uh, um, studies and much research on this. She published another massive analysis of data confirming the higher risk of early death among the, lone, among the lonely. By that point, a growing number of research papers were reporting that loneliness was associated with a greater risk of coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, dementia, depression, and anxiety, mm -hmm. which is crazy. So, I guess this is a hopefully a call to all of our listeners, whether you are, or you yes, know somebody who is experiencing loneliness, this is not just an emotional issue. The, this is a, a, a life issue, that, that if you can find a way, both individually and for others, to create more connections, the greater your lifespan will be, and the, again, reduced by 50% the possibility of dying prematurely. Yes, you just said everything I had under the price of loneliness, <laughs> which is all those things. Um, it's terrifying. And then I think also it puts pressure on people who maybe are single or who are widowed and are thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm all alone. But this is the key here, right? Really, what is loneliness? It's not even feeling 
like you're your own companion, that you don't get solace in spending time with yourself, that maybe your connection with the creator isn't as strong as it should be. Because really, if you're living in that way, you're never going to get to this state. Right. So I think this is a, a key point, that one of the benefits, and by the way, the research shows this as well, one of the benefits of a spiritual life, and a sense of connection to what is greater than you, that, that again, whether you call it God, whether you call it the Creator, whether you call it the light of the Creator, whether you call it the universe, or you or call what's it, your favorite one? Which one? The guy in the sky. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> but which are, no, I, that's the one I would I would least like to to use <laughs> as an example. The fact that we can develop, and this is again, I hope it's not a, a new concept to many of our listeners, that we can develop a sense of being surrounded by this loving force all the time. And again, you can call it nature. The, the fact that you know when we walk through nature and we walk through a forest, the sense should not be that I am individually walking through this external reality of nature, but rather there is a there's a oneness. There's a sense of oneness between me and that which surrounds me. And that's supporting you all the time. And that's supporting me, exactly. Exactly. And I think that, that develop, that's one of the most important uh, aspects of a spiritual life, of a spiritual development, is really, I mean, we should all ask ourselves the question, forgetting about, and we, I think it is important to talk, to talk about the need to go out, outside of ourselves and create deeper and deeper and stronger uh, social connections with others. The first question has to be, when I'm in a room by myself, when I'm going to sleep at night, do I feel, when I'm walking out in the world, do I feel a sense of a surrounding force, call it again, whatever you will, that is with me all the time? I think that that is one of the most important first steps. And it doesn't happen in one day, and it doesn't happen by beginning a spiritual practice or life, but rather it needs to be a constant, something that I think about often. That, that sense of being surrounded, surrounded by a force that is protecting me, that is guiding me, that is loving. And that is, is, again, a very important first step. So I would ask our listeners to ask themselves, how often do you feel that on your own? How often do you, do you make a point of really connecting to that force that surrounds you? Well, I th- that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think before, absolutely, obviously, I agree. But I think that there is a step that needs to happen for people to be able to get to where you're saying. And that is, where are their thoughts? Because if thoughts, right, are um, thoughts of negativity or, or thinking that you are all alone and that there isn't something greater, those thoughts are going to dictate your reality. And there's a, a really, I think, an amazing example of being able to get to the state of um, connecting to yourself and changing your thoughts is, Nelson Mandela. I don't know if you've read his autobiography. It's called The Long Walk to Freedom, which he began and completed during his 27 years in prison. It was three different prisons. And he became became a close friend of his own company, but he didn't start out like that at all. So, and in navigating our isolation, right, wherever we are at in our own lives, each one of us, I think that his words actually can offer a lot. So, it says that when he was first imprisoned in Pretoria Central Prison, he was thrown into solitary confinement. And he had his first encounter with forced isolation. And he wrote this in his book. For the next few weeks, I was completely and utterly isolated. And can you even comprehend that? Like, <laughs> I didn't see the face or hear the voice of another prisoner. I was locked up for Hello? 23 Hello. hours a day with 30 minutes of exercise in the morning and again in the afternoon. I had never been in isolation before, and every hour seemed like a year. I mean, I have the chills just reading that. There is no natural light in my cell. A single bulb burned overhead 24 hours a day. I did not have a wristwatch, and I often thought it was the middle of the night when it was only late afternoon. I'm not going to read that part, but he has a whole other section on time and how when you don't have that, you can even lose your sanity and the importance of routine, right? And finding and doing things that are important to you like connecting to nature or, I mean, he didn't say that, but I'm, I'm adding that part. Um, he goes on to say, I had nothing to read, nothing to write on or with, no one to talk to. The mind begins to turn on itself and one desperately wants something outside of oneself on which to fix one's attention. I have known men who took half a dozen lashes in preference to being locked up alone. 
After a time in solitary, I relished the company of even the insects in my cell and found myself on the verge of initiating conversations with the cockroach. <laughs> Several decade, late, decades after this experience, Mandela, then the president of South Africa, was asked about his time in prison. His answer, I came out mature. His confrontation with the loudness of his own thoughts stands out as particularly insightful reminder of what builds strength of character and defines leadership. The first off, the first obstacle we must overcome is our own mind. This means we need to find ways to become comfortable being alone with our own thoughts. Much later in the book, he reflects on his own growth and writes, to, sur to survive in prison, one must develop ways to take satisfaction in one's daily life. One can feel fulfilled by washing one's clothes so that they are particularly clean, by sweeping a corridor so that's free of dust, by organizing one's cell to conserve as much space as possible. Now, this is so profound to me because the I think the the at the core of loneliness is that our thoughts are not connected with our our soul, with our true essence. Our thoughts are usually rooted in an ego version of life, of love, and we go through that in life and often we're left feeling really lonely and disappointed because we're not manifesting and becoming what we're meant to in this lifetime. So I think a good place to start before with what you said is that where are your thoughts? Are they kind? Are they nourishing? Do they support you? Do they make, do they console you? And I think that you had asked me earlier, have you ever been lonely? The answer is yes, no, and then yes. And when did it start to get better? It was once I started a spiritual path and I actually started to enjoy my own company. I became a person where I could trust myself to make good choices for myself. I would have a dialogue with myself that felt very kind and loving versus that judgmental punishing voice I had in the years before. And, and I didn't fully realize that actually until my father had a, a brain tumor and it was benign, but he wanted it out of his head. Like there's no way he wanted to keep that there. And there's a great hospital in Houston and it was going to be like a 12 hour surgery. It turned out to be 18 hours. And my mom didn't want to go alone. So I decided to go with her and the kids were really young then. We had three at the time and I traveled and I wasn't sure if I should stay even longer over Shabbat. I had never missed it with you and the kids. And I remember having that moment where I'm having this conversation and then I knew the right thing to do. And it wasn't because it was, I'm supposed to, or I'm going to be a good daughter or I'm a bad person, but I don't. It was that I stopped and I had that conversation with a friend, which was myself, which was also connected to the creator. We were having a conversation all together and I decided to stay. And I remember when I flew home a few days later, I was like, you know, you can really rely on yourself to make good choices. And that is like, at the heart of friendship, right? You feel that safe space, that connection. So I just thought that was a really powerful example with Nelson Mandela, but I also think, yeah. practicing I think that's that. the point. The point is, if you're not a good friend to yourself, you're never going to be a good friend to somebody else. And and because we, you know, it's interesting because we know we know people. You see people who are lonely, but it's almost impossible for them to fix their loneliness, even with social connection, because they're so not kind to themselves that you can't paper that over even with social interaction and you can't even get the social interactions right usually or with the right people or in the right way right. and then you don't understand why and right. you're like i'm making an effort but it's not working out i mean everything starts with self right right and i think so i think so we said two steps right one, one is your thoughts, thoughts. and your second yeah. getting to a place where you're or really asking yourself and working towards getting to a place where you're very comfortable in your own skin you're very comfortable uh with your friendship with yourself now the third which i think is is very important very very important as well is literally searching out searching out the right social interactions and it's interesting you know there's, there's i love when we're so aligned like we're we're completely I have a name for what you're saying, but like, no, 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 you're going to first you're going to first introduce this, and then I'll add to it. Um, well, right. So, so going outside of ourselves for for social connection, and what I was actually going to go to is the evolutionary part of it. If we, we did, you want to share that? No, or no, no, no. okay, so I, I always think it's interesting because science can tell us, at least to some degree, why things are. And I think it's the spiritual teachings that give us an understanding of of why they have to be that way, or right. So where, where do they come from? So 
here's what neuroscientists think um, happens in your brain. The human brain, having evolved to seek safety in numbers, registers loneliness as a threat. The centers that monitor for danger, including the amygdala, go into overdrive, triggering a release of fight or flight stress hormones. When a person feels lonely? Exactly. Because we have evolved, right? So when, when prehistoric man, well, right, in order to, to, to survive, to, to grow, to, to be, to be safe, pack. to eat, and needed, needed, a needed a group. So today, and this is what actually, this is why it's crazy. You think about it. Why would a person sitting alone all by themselves suddenly be filled with stress and a fight or flight reflex? Because the mind knows if I'm alone, if I'm experiencing loneliness, something's very, very wrong. And all that it's, again, old, it's evolutionary, old software running it's, in our brain. Yeah, it's, but are, it's the software that's currently running. And again, to my, I would like to add soon that there's a spiritual reason for it, right? But anyway, but wait, there's a difference, though. I want to just a distinction between loneliness and solitude, right? Because solitude is you're choosing to be alone and use that time for reflection or enjoyment which of your own important. company, which is necessary. I just want to make that yeah. distinction. And right. loneliness, obviously, is isolation that persists even if we're with people or not. Right. So further, right? So stress hormones increase when a person is experiencing loneliness. Your heart rate rises, your blood pressure and blood sugar levels increase to provide that's energy in case you need it. Mm, that's fascinating. Your body produces extra inflammatory cells to repair tissue damage and prevent infection, even though, again, there's no tissue Real damage. Threat. But as we know, the, the, one of the worst things that happens to a body is when there's inflammation. Um, Isn't it amazing, the body? It's just like... If that... And fewer antibodies to fight viruses. Mm. Subconsciously, you start to view other people as potential threats, sources of rejection or apathy, and less as friends, remedies for your loneliness. So it's almost a, that what was loop. the last part. So after, no, I just didn't hear what you oh said. yeah, yeah. So uh, you start to view other people more as potential threats, sources of rejection and apathy, and less as friends, remedies for your loneliness. Mm -hmm. So you can't so even recognize the people. Well, it's around. worse. It's worse. It actually loneliness besides the damage that it does physiologically to the body, stress hormones, reduction of immunity, uh, higher blood pressure, high uh, uh, blood sugar levels. It also creates this distorted view of others in your mind. You don't no longer see them as the cure for loneliness, but often you'll see them as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And again, so all this comes, at least according to the scientists, um, from evolution. Now, on a spiritual level, one of the most important and fundamental teachings is that we are all of one, right? We spoke spark, the same spark, same soul. We're all unified as one, and that the only way that we grow in all ways, but it is spiritually, the only way our soul accomplishes its purpose in this world is by connecting to more and more and more and more people. You know, there's there's a in, in the Kabbalistic tradition, there are certain things you can only do with a group, whether it's three people or ten, ten people. people this <laughs> why we do a lot of that, <laughs> right? But the point is that 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 it's all based on the understanding that I, what I cannot do ever alone, I can do with one other person. I can do with two other people. I can do with nine other people, and it's a very very important basic spiritual understanding. I need you. I need other people and those interactions, consciously, subconsciously, but for my spiritual benefits, for my soul's growth. I cannot grow, and ultimately, therefore, I cannot be ultimately in the state that I'm supposed to be, in, in manifesting my potential as I, as I can and, and I'm meant to, unless I am in relatively constant interaction and connection with others. So for us to thrive in every aspect of our being, emotionally, mentally, physically, um, spiritually, we need to be in in groups of people, obviously, exactly. that are like-minded. Um, there's a thing called the third place. Have you heard of this? Third place. So, and this is where um, this comes in uh, very perfectly. It was coined by sociologist Ray Oldenburg in the 1980s. And he refers to a physical location other than work or home. So your first place is your home. Your second place is your work. Now many people are working from home, so their first and second are the same. 
Uh, but your third place is somewhere you can connect with others, share your thoughts and dreams and have fun. A third place is an anchor of the community and usually a public setting that hosts frequent and informal gatherings of people. I mean, that's what I really love about our community because we that's very much how we live our lives all the time, right? Most people are loyal to their place and return regularly to unwind, socialize. Third places are where there's little to no financial barrier to enter and where conversation is the primary activity. So historical examples of this that Oldenburg cites in his book is The Great Good Place. It includes French cafes, German-American beer gardens, English pubs, churches, religious communities. And the lack of third places to socialize has caused dissatisfaction among many people. And in fact, there's less, there's a decline of where those places are in the world today, according to Robert Putnam in his book, Bowling Alone. Right. So if you look even at blue zone regions, right, we talk about this a lot. Blue Uh, zones, just for our listeners, are the places where people live longer than any other place in the world. Unusual longevity. Uh, they have, they have, in all of those places, strong faith communities and deep social networks. And that's not a coincidence, right? Of course. So, if anybody out there doesn't have a third place, you're welcome to join ours. Um, but yeah, it's super important, and I think that that's. I, I don't think I think I kind of just stumbled into that when I chose this lifestyle. I never fully appreciated how much that gives me and our family every day. Yeah, and the fact, and on a spiritual level, which I think is very important to understand. There's a an interesting um, teaching. It says that if you have a friend that you haven't seen in 30 days, you have to make a, there's blessings that you make for any special interaction. What does it say in English? What is it? Well, it's it's a strange one. So it's yeah, it's, I had a feeling that's why. No, no, it is. So in English, it is blessed. We're thanking the Creator for reviving the dead. <laughs> For it's a blessing for re- reviving the dead. And of course, a Kabbalist asks, it's a very strange blessing to make when you, you haven't seen your friend, friend in 30 days. So what they say, and this is, I think is a very beautiful teaching, and I think hopefully it'll inspire our listeners to really do more to, to connect and create friendships and create that third place, um, that when two people, friends, meet, they have a drink together, they have a conversation together, they create an energy. You can call it angel, which is what the ancient capitalists would call it, but basically it's an energy. So it's not just me, even me and you right now, right? We're sitting here, we're having a conversation. It's not, that's not where it ends, right? We're actually creating this collective energy together. Now, so therefore they say, if that angel or that energy that one creates needs to be sustained, and if you haven't sustained it for 30 days, which means you haven't seen each other in 30 days, it begins to die that energy that you create together. When you see each other again, you make that blessing for the resurrection of the dead. The, the energy, that the, that third force, call it that angel that we create together, needs has now been revived. But it's not an entity, together. it's an energy. You're calling it an angel, but... Well, the, the, the ancient Kabbalists called it an angel. A I force think, that does good, because when there's goodness between two, then that and it creates, reverberates. Yeah, so, but you can, I, I think it is important to actually even imagine it as this cloud of energy the two friends, when they meet, when they hug, when they drink this together, great. We're, when we're they talk, we're creating lots of angels. When absolutely, we do this absolutely. And I think that, and I think that's the point. The point is that two people coming together, even just two friends coming together, uh, in a in a positive social interaction, create an energy that neither one of them alone can create. And that I think explains the physical, physiological benefits because there's a tremendous spiritual energy that is awakened when people come together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, one of the things that my mother would often, when people would come to my mother and they would either, I don't know if the words complain, but we're talking about that there's something growing wrong, there's something they're unhappy about, she would always say, you know, go go and do something for somebody else. And I think that's another element where, where we're talking about importance of social interactions that benefit us. But there's the whole other category, which is as important, if not even more important. And there's literally to go outside of yourself, right? Because usually when you say, when you think, you know, am I going to go have a coffee with my friend? Am I going to go to my friend's birthday party? It's often based on, you know, what what is my um, uh, benefit that's going to come from it, which is fine, right? Because we do have friendships for benefit. But what about the, the where, where are the places, call it the, the third place, but where are those places where we're actually giving? actually giving. And I would posit to our listeners, I would say actually unequivocally, that unless you ha- you can point to one time this day, every day, 
that you had an interaction with somebody that was not for your benefit, that you didn't do it because, oh, I miss that friend, oh, I'm doing it because I, you know, he, he or she makes me feel good when I'm with them. Those are great and necessary as well. But I'm talking about the other category, the category where I'm saying, I'm going to do this because I know this brings benefit to somebody else. Did you have a day like, did you have a moment like that today? Yeah. Yeah. Do tell. I, well, I'll actually share with something that happened yesterday, which was more impactful, but, but I try to do, I, I, I don't allow a day to go by where the, I do not go outside of myself. Um, it, could be, it could be over the phone, it could be in person. So, yesterday, one of our dear friends' father passed away. And, and he called me, he called me, I actually didn't answer, I called him back, and he was in great, great pain. He was crying, and he was in great, great pain. He had just lost his father. And he kept on saying, you know, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. And I knew that my only job, my only purpose in that phone call is to be there, just to be there. You can make somebody feel better when they just, their dad just died, passed away. I hope and I believe that in some way that conversation, me just simply being there, not anything, anything that I said, helped him in some way. But after the call, the third, the thought that I had, which I really hope uh, resonates with our listeners, he said, I'm so appreciative of the fact that I'm in a position where there is somebody, and maybe and, and, and other people who, when they're in pain, they You're the phone call. A, a call that they'll make to me in some way. Again, of course, we don't heal people like that, and certainly when somebody's experiencing great pain, but it is such a merit to be somebody who's there for other people. And and I don't take that for granted. I don't take that for granted. You know, again. Every day I get a call from somebody who's either going through, you know, medical issues, other issues, business issues. And for me, the most important thought that I always raise is, you know, I'm so lucky, so blessed that I am in a position where people want to call me when they're in pain. And in some way, hopefully, it assists. And so I really ask our listeners to ask themselves this question. Do you make sure, can you make sure, that every single day there is a social interaction you are having that is not for your benefit, that is benefit for others? The, the benefits that you receive are endless, but that is not even the point. It is actually, if you want to be at peace, if you want to not feel loneliness, one of the greatest tools that you need to, you need to use is to make sure that you are going outside of yourself. And having one social interaction every day that is for the benefit of the other person. And that was a big extreme example. I think it's also sometimes more difficult to do it in smaller ways with strangers, right? To go out of your way for connection. I mean, I, I think sometimes in our minds we think, oh, to combat loneliness, it has to be like this, you know, it has to be an, a, an important friendship or a lifelong one, or it's just more about connecting with people every day. Absolutely. And going out of your way to do that. Uh, which you just reminded me of a quote from, from Mahatma Gandhi. He said, with every true friendship, we build more firmly the foundations on which the peace of the whole world rests. Mm -hmm. And that is the idea, the idea that, that there is a collective effect. That if every one of our, of our thousands of listeners would really commit to, to doing actions that are not social interactions, that are not for their benefit, it changes. It changes I, ourselves, certainly, but it changes the world. It changes the world around us. So, I speak very openly at where I exercise every day, Tracy Anderson, and how it's a big part of my life. But today, I found myself exercising next to somebody I had seen before in passing, um, but never spoken to. She's kind of newer. And after sweating next to her for like 90 minutes, saying no words, right? We're in a class. Um, we're cleaning up after, and I decided like, you know, because it's not my nature really to be like, hi, I'm Monica, what's your, I just not, like, I've never been that person, right? And, and more and more, I'm, I'm committed to doing that, and I do it. Anyway, I went over to her, and I'm like, hi, I'm Monica, what's your name? I, I think it's Liz, right? And she's like, yes. And we started talking, and and she had, like, questions just about, work, like, and I just felt so good after just connecting, going out of my way to meet somebody new. Um, and then her first thing she said is, you know, I spend more time in this room with these people than anybody else in my life. Right, right. But then we wouldn't even have a conversation, right? And I I just walk and I got something out of the conversation too. And it just felt like not just felt like that's part of humanity. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, I don't think you're supposed to walk by people and just ignore them and not say hi, how are you? But unfortunately that's 
that's really how we mostly go through our days. Yeah. It's reminded me completely off topic of a I Seinfeld something funny. <laughs> of, of a Seinfeld episode where again for our listeners, I'm sure many of them do watch Seinfeld, where George um um speaks to somebody advisor of one of the mayors of New York that, that everybody should wear name tags. So we become friendly <laughs> to everybody on the street. I like that. <laughs> um, and I think also in our culture and in, in American society, there is a strong um value placed on being it you know an individual and have self-reliance and i think that it's so ingrained in us sometimes we think we don't really need people right we don't really need to be part of a group or need their help i just need to be my own person and i think it can get us into trouble honestly no, and, and it and discourages yeah. people from relying on others for support and it's uncomfortable to rely nobody really wants to be that vulnerable but it's a, it's an important thing and i think it's our ego lying to us yes you can be an individual and yes you can be self-reliant for sure but that doesn't change how much we also need people and i would i would add to that very strongly that when we talk about a spiritual growth the distance between who we are what we've done, even those of us who've done important and good things, great things in our lives, the distance between who we are and who we're meant to be is great. One of the most powerful tools, one of the most powerful tools to ensure growth and therefore greater manifestation of our potential is to have more and more and more interactions with people. I promise you that the more you put yourself out there for social interaction with others, especially of the kind that we spoke about before, which is, which is for the benefit of, of that person, That's not, not yourself. That's not behind the phone. You will, absolutely, <laughs> you will absolutely grow. And there is actually a, a story from one of, a great, of the great teachers, where he shared that the reason why he gained so much wisdom, he believed, is not because he was wise, or he deserved it, or he merited it, or he spent so much time studying, but because the, creat- the Creator saw that he was, wanted to teach other people, so the Creator had to give him the wisdom for those that he desired like to that. share with. And I think it is a very important, beautiful, almost spiritual trick. You want more, whether it is money, wisdom, happiness, make sure that you surround yourself with more and more people who need all those things from you, and therefore you will have to get, the Creator will have to give them to you. Whether you deserve the wealth, you will have to get it, because you, the Creator sees there is 10, 100, 1,000 people who need your physical support. You want to be have wisdom? Get people around you, two people, five people, ten people, a thousand people who need wisdom from you. You will gain, you will get wisdom from the light of the Creator. You want happiness? Find ten people, a hundred people, a thousand people who you increase their happiness. The Creator will have to give you the happiness to give it to them. It's very, I, I, it's one of those things that I, I think about this often when I think about my own life and, and in the ways that I am very, very blessed. I am sure that a very, a very big part of it is the fact that I, I try to put myself out there to, to give wisdom, to give support, to hopefully give happiness to other people. And I, I, I say to all of our listeners, I promise you, you will see the benefits of this. You will mm-hmm. see the benefits I of it. I love that. So if we do not take um, Seinfeld's suggestion with the name tags, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy had a three-fold plan. Very basic, but I think it is something to have our listeners have in their minds. One was supporting school-based programs that teach children about building healthy relationships. You would think that's automatic, but it's not. Workplace design that fosters social connection and community programs that bring people together. So these are just really practical things, aside from we said to do internally and spiritually, that we can do for the world. The second is renegotiate our relationship with technology. Very well said. Creating space in our lives without our devices, so we can be more present with one another. Speaking of which, next date night, your phone has to stay home. I'm speaking <laughs> to you. That also means <laughs> that also means choosing not to take part in online dialogues that amplify judgment and hate instead of understanding. Uh, that will get rid of ninety nine percent of social. Social. I wasn't really joking. Like no phone. You you, you too. I'm not. It's not. I don't have that issue. <laughs> And the third, <laughs> finally, we I'll have, let that go and allow our listeners to have the complete false uh, 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 view uh, of, uh, finally, of our phone usage during date night. We have to take steps in our personal lives to rebuild our connection to one another. Spending 15 minutes each day to reach out to people we care about, oh, introducing ourselves to our neighbors, which, by the way, I tried to do um, 
Only one person responded. I mean, I, I made I made cookies. I got little I like bottles important. of alcohol with a, a, no, a handwritten note, and only one and a half neighbors responded. One came Be over. Okay and, with rejection? I, think I was okay not, with it. I I'm was not just, talking to you. I'm talking to our listeners. By like, the way, there are, there are people who you can go over to. Abigail them. looked at me. She's like, "How come nobody wrote anything back?" We got one note, one thank you note. Again, I think yeah, right, you, you, because if you're doing it for the right reason. No, I didn't yeah. care. I just thought. That would I I did it with I did it because I actually wanted to connect. <laughs> yes. That didn't happen. Um, and the third part of that is checking on coworkers who may be having a hard time. Right. It's interesting. I I was uh, I I saw this um, uh, video from Scott Galloway, he's a professor at NYU, and he was talking about the fact that one of the things that he that he when he mentors younger people, he says one of the things that that I wish I had known when I was younger is that. You know, when you have a thought about somebody, share it with them. Because again, we're afraid of rejection, right? So even like, you know, we were at a concert a few weeks ago, and right, we had this, then we saw the person who, who performed, and we were, you know, should we go over, should we not go over, right? No, is it the embarrassed? What if he, you know, what if he, you know, doesn't take it well? The point is, yeah, sometimes people take it well, some things they won't. Also, I just don't want it annoy him. It seemed like he had a really yeah, busy yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point, my point is, and this is, and this is something that Scott Galloway said, is again, not necessarily, you know, sort of famous musicians, but, a friend, a coworker, somebody you know, always make the choice to interact and not, yeah. and not, not that it will always go well, but that it is it will always be for your benefit. No, like the girl at the gym today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, are so, you going to read us a letter? I'd like to read a letter, but I'd like to end with a quote from Khalil Gibran. I have a quote too, but you go ahead. Let there be no purpose in friendship, save the deepening of the spirit. Mm. And I think that's true not just about friendship. I love it's, the way he writes. It's yes. so beautiful. It's true. It's it's true not just about friendship. It's true about social interaction, deepening, deepening. That's what that is. What deepens the spirit in ways that we know, in ways that are beyond our comprehension. So I want to remind our listeners: please share this episode with others who may benefit from listening. We're not alone. I like uh, what Lady Gaga said. She said, "I don't think I could think of a single thing that's more isolating than being famous." And if we feel lonely, there are always ways to connect. And I am quoting Taylor Swift, who I'm, I'm a converted Swifty now. Just went to her concert last week. It was awesome. So she said, I turned, and I can really relate to this, because I think that's why I turned to writing in my own way. I turned to songwriting because I didn't really have anybody else to talk to. I was going through a very lonely phase at school, which a lot of kids do. It's just when you're going through it, you feel like you're the only one going through it. So I'd like to read a letter from one of our listeners. And again, I'd like to uh, thank everybody who writes uh, emails to Monica and myself to this podcast every week. I really, really enjoy reading them. It inspires me, inspires us. And those that we get to share, we read all of them. Those that we get to share also inspire our listeners. And I was I was debating today which one to read. This is one from somebody who's actually sent us one before, and we read it on our podcast. But I'm going to read it again, and hopefully you'll see why. You read so, this letter already? You read one no, from No, no, one from okay. him, Jason. So, greetings, Monica and Michael. I have to share this story. It blew my mind. I try to condense it. Please excuse the typos. On April 29th, I listened to episode 76. There are no coincidences. It resonated because I'm sensitive to receiving and recognizing, mess recognizing messages often. The following May Day mo Monday, I was taking my daily walk. I passed a church. Something red and glossy on the sidewalk caught my eye. When I approached, I recognized it as a piece of a Rubik's Cube. When I came home, I started preparing a late lunch while listening to the April 10th episode, number 130, Letting Go, The Secret to Manifesting Greater Blessings. My birthday, in parentheses, was April 11th. Happy birthday, Jason. Monica's opener included a cute story about a Rubik's Cube. As the episode came to Thank an you. end, Michael began sharing a letter from a listener. As he spoke, I felt like I was gonged on the head. The letter was from me. <laughs> I fell to my knees and wept. Aww. I don't know what it means, but I took it as encouragement from the universe, and I'm on the right path some way, somehow. Yeah. Thank you, Monica and Michael, my favorite peanut M&Ms. <laughs> you have given me so much hope. P.S. I'd love to hear more about Tikkun and astrology. God bless and never stop sharing insight, joy, and laughter. I love Isn't that. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, yeah, so, so nice. So, Jason, yes, thank you. You, this really brought, it's a brought sign. Us. It's definitely, <laughs> definitely a sign for you, for Monica, myself, and for all of our listeners. So, thank you for sharing that story. This is a great time to remind all of our listeners. Please continue to share your topics, ideas, stories, inspirations, 
with us at Mike, Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. We read all of your letters. They inspire us. Those that we read inspire all of our listeners. Please make sure to keep sending them in. As always, remember to share this podcast with everybody you know, especially this one. And go to Apple, Apple Podcasts, give five-star, write reviews, give it five stars, and share it with as many people as possible. The more people, as we just shared, the more people you share this podcast with, the more light that you will receive and less loneliness that you will experience. So we hope you enjoy listening to this podcast as much as we enjoy recording. Stay spiritually hungry.